After the federal court ruling this past week striking down the federal mask mandates on planes and public transit, very few indoor masking requirements remain in the U.S. That's as public health experts brace for the next COVID surge and as parents of kids under five anxiously await an approved vaccine for them. For more on this, I spoke with Dr. Peter Hotez. He's a professor of pediatrics and molecular virology at Baylor College of Medicine, and he's also co-director of the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development. Dr. Hotez, thanks for being with us. And given where we are in this pandemic, what's the effect of indoor masking becoming entirely optional in most places, and now on planes, buses, and trains in most cases, uh, given the federal ruling? Clearly, we're not going to have to require masks in perpetuity. I don't think that was any that was ever anybody's intention. Uh, my recommendation was to keep mask mandates in place at least until we get over this BA.2 hump, because this BA.2 subvariant is the most transmissible we've seen before, even more transmissible than Omicron and getting up there with the level of, of measles. So mm. this only really works well if both the recipient of the virus and the deliverer of the virus both are masked, and then it greatly reduces your risk. But to just have it one side and now, I think, is not nearly as efficient. And from a public health perspective, does the shift away from masking, does that make it harder for local governments to reinstate mask mandates if there's another wave? That's exactly right. And, and this is what I worry about. I think, you know, we you know, only have a limited toolbox in terms of uh, our ability to control this virus. Vaccines and boosting being one of them, but the other is, is wearing masks. And when we're at a low point in terms of virus transmission, I think then we can get away without uh, wearing masks. But once virus transmission goes up, especially with these new highly transmissible variants, it's really important everybody has a mask on. And it's really important that public health officials have at their disposal the ability to implement mask mandates for that period of time when transmission is going up. And I and I think um, it, it's really unfortunate what, what happened with a federal judge in Florida to undermine um, the CDC's efforts. So let's talk about variants. Uh, what happens with this pandemic after the BA2 wave? How do we navigate it? After this BA2 wave, I think we're going to get a bit of a reprieve, um, maybe for a few weeks, maybe for a few months. Uh, I, we don't really know, but here, here's what I'm worried about next. We've had um, a pretty serious wave of COVID-19 in the southern states and in Texas in the summer of 2020 and the summer of 2021. So I have to believe that we're at risk from another variant, TBD, to be determined coming from abroad, um, hitting the southern states in Texas starting in July again. We need to be able to um, have the ability to ask people to put masks on again, in addition to keeping up with their boosters. And then after that, you know, there are models out there that suggest we could be in for regular winter waves in January, February of COVID-19, just as we've ex been experiencing for years with the upper respiratory coronaviruses, even pre-pandemic. So the point is, this pandemic could last for a few years. Being able to adjust our requirements to manage it during these periods when transmission is going up is going to be the key to saving lives. Let's talk about vaccinations for the youngest children, ages zero to five. Administration health officials, they once hoped to authorize, you know, first shots for young children at the beginning of this year. Now they're saying uh, June, most likely. What's the latest and what accounts for the delay? I think the delay is the fact that at the at, they went down to a much lower dose of vaccine for the um, for the under fives. And by doing that, they got less of a robust uh, immune response in these really young kids. And, and, and now it looks as though they're going to need that third dose in order to give adequate um, uh, levels of, of protective immunity. So most likely what they're doing is waiting to see that data from the third dose before they, they green light it. When we've talked in the past, you've made the point that if we're to end this pandemic, we've got to make a COVID vaccine available to underserved nations across the globe, really, to prevent future variants from forming. And you and your colleagues have developed a low-cost vaccine called Corbivax. Tell us about that and how it's helping to close the vaccination gap. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, remember, Delta arose out of an unvaccinated population in India last year and 
Omicron and BA2 arose out of an unvaccinated population out of Southern Africa last year. So until we vaccinate the world's low and middle income countries, Mother Nature is going to continue to hurl uh, significant variants of concern uh, at us. And so with that in mind, we developed a vaccine um, that uses an older technology, recombinant protein fermentation and yeast, that's already in place in many low and middle income countries. We use that same approach for a COVID-19 vaccine that looks really uh, promising in terms of levels of uh, protective antibody and T-cell responses. We licensed it with no patent to uh, vaccine producers in India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, now Botswana. So it's really great that we can make that kind of contribution to addressing vaccine uh, inequalities. Absolutely. Certainly encouraging, Dr. Hotez. Great to see you as always. Thanks for your time. And next week on the News Hour, my colleague John Yang reports on the vaccine for the world developed by Dr. Hotez and his team to fight COVID vaccine inequity.